Hi friends, welcome back for another virtual visit Facebook Live. Today I'm joining you from the west wing of the aquarium and I have Christina, one of our interactive exhibits Aquarius. Now Christina's face might look a little familiar <laughs> because she's joined us before to talk about training sharks in our Shark and Ray Touch Tank. But training sharks is not Christina's only skill. She's also the keeper of this beautiful exhibit that you're seeing behind us. Now, this exhibit is pretty inconspicuous at first glance. It's actually pretty easy to cruise right by when the aquarium's busy. But this is one of my favorite tanks in the whole building because there's so much going on in this exhibit. Down here in the water, you're gonna see lots of unusual animals. Usually we have upside down jellies in here. We have pajama fish. We have these gorgeous juvenile damselfish. And um, the coolest thing that you might not notice if you don't stop to take a thorough look is that right in the middle of this tank, we are growing mangrove trees. And that is what we're gonna talk about today. So Christina, can you tell us a little bit about what makes mangrove trees so special? Yeah, definitely. So the first thing that I want to point out is that if you look at the roots, they're actually in the water, completely submerged. And some of you guys might have some house plants that you've taken a cutting and popped into water some, to get some roots on them. Um, but this is actually full salt water. So it's the same salinity you would get out in the harbor. And so they have adapted to be able to grow in these environments. These trees are really important. They grow along shorelines. Um, and so they have a lot of uh, kind of brackish water, which means a mix between fresh water coming out from rivers and salt water coming in from the ocean. And they have to be able to deal with that. Another thing that's really fascinating to me about these trees um, is that they have this nice kind of thick succulent leaf. If you guys were able to, to um, feel this, it feels really waxy. And a lot of times people think that they're fake because of that. <laughs> and if you look at the lights in this exhibit, you'll see that hopefully you can see sometimes the camera will change what the lighting looks like, um, but they're extremely bright. So if you think about places like the Bahamas or Florida or Indo-Pacific climates, um, very tropical, very warm, and extremely sunny. So in the wild, these trees can grow up to 80 feet tall, and they're growing in full sunlight. That is incredible. Um, I think my favorite thing about mangrove trees is that ability to survive in salt water. That is so incredibly unique for trees. Um, I think, in <laughs> fact, these guys are maybe the only tree that can do that, which is really cool. I'll, I'll fact check that for you guys afterwards, <laughs> I promise. Um, Christina, can you tell us a little bit about what it takes to grow trees inside? Like, what do these guys need to thrive in this exhibit? Yeah, definitely. So kind of touching on what you just mentioned, when we think about mangrove forests as ecology, ecologists, there's usually a lot of different trees um, that are growing, a lot of different plants that are growing in that environment. There are three different species that are considered true mangroves, and this is one of them. These are the red mangroves, um, which are Rhizophora mangle. Um, and so these guys, like I said earlier, need high light, but they're also living in these tropical environments where they need high humidity. Mm. And even in the summer here in Boston, you might go outside and say, boy, it's so hot. But <laughs> as soon as you go in your house and you have the air conditioning running, it's dry. And certainly in the winter with the heat running, it's very dry. Mm. So we actually have a humidifier installed in this exhibit. Um, and if you were to peek right over in the corner here, you can see up in the corner this black tubing right there. And that's where the humidifier is blowing humid air out into the exhibit. And then we have different sensors in here that help us control that. This particular mangrove is not one that sweats, um, which is a term that we use for another species of mangrove. Um, and one of the ways that they deal with living in this salt water is by actually pulling those extra salts up through their roots and excreting them out of their leaves. And so they'll have these kind of, um, we'll refer to them as sweating on the tips of their leaves where they have these salty um, deposits there. So some people who grow mangroves in um, inside will actually need to spray or wash down these leaves to make sure that they're rinsing away those extra deposits. Cool. Now you mentioned that the lighting is really specific in this exhibit. Can you talk a little bit about the lights and like what makes these lights really special? Yeah, so um, we actually have several different types of lights in this exhibit. Um, historically, we've used, uh, uh, sorry, fluorescent lights and metal halide lights. And right now, 
um we're actually trialing a full led system, which is pretty unique um and we're still testing it out and hopefully it works well but they do require high light. if you notice in the back i've actually got two smaller trees back here and you can see that those guys are actually getting a lot less light and they're quite a bit shorter and so this tree over here is actually the same age as the tree in front of it and the growth has been very very slow because that light is so much less back there we also have um, horticultural lights and so if you were to look right above that little light up uh, sorry little tree right there you can see that black light fixture at the very top can you catch that on the camera nice and so when those are turned on they actually have bright purple lights and that's because plants are green because they reflect green wavelength but they will absorb red and blue and so by using these purple lights we're putting all of the energy that we can into generating usable photosynthetic light for those plants so oh, cool. All right, Christina, I would imagine there are some challenges with keeping trees alive in the middle of an aquarium exhibit. Can you maybe tell us what are some of your biggest challenges for caring for these mangrove trees? Yeah, definitely. So this is probably something that applies to um, not just mangroves, but any kind of plant that's not growing in its typical environment. So any kind of house plant, um, and even to some extent agricultural plants on farms will get pests. So you can have mm -hmm. disease, um, you can have all kinds of different things. And here at the aquarium, we do have um, some bugs <laughs> that are not ideal to have on our plants. And let me see if I can find you some. So you might be able to come up close and see these little guys right here. This little tan speck right there, and that's called a scale bug. So those of you who do have house plants at home, you probably are already familiar with them. And as soon as you see one, you might spray chemicals on your plant to try to control that population. Um, you might uh, rinse your plant with strong stream of water or even clip away heavily infested parts of your plant. And we can do most of that here. We obviously can't use chemicals for a variety of reasons, including the fact that we don't want overspray in the water. But we have also um, decided that we want to uh, use the most ecologically healthy option that we can. And so we developed what's called an integrated pest management plan. That's a really big word, but really <laughs> all it means is that we're gonna live in harmony with the bugs. So as long as the population of those scale bugs is low enough that they're not damaging the trees, that's fine. And one of the ways we control their population is by using beneficial insects. Um, Cool. So here at the aquarium, we use green lace wings. You can see right here, I've got a little card that has a bunch of eggs on it. So when these eggs hatch, um, small larvae will crawl around on the tree branches. And these guys love to eat scale, which is perfect for us um, because they'll clean up some of that pest uh, infestation off of the trees. And you can see that the leaves look nice and healthy, even though there are a few pest insects on these trees. And that really helps us avoid doing things like heavy chemical treatment um, and other things like that. We do still use sharp streams of water to try to reduce heavily infested spots. And I will prune away spots that are just so infested that they would be problematic. But since we've been using beneficial insects, they've been maintaining that population over time. And we found that we don't need to do those uh, very invasive treatments as often as we did before. That is really cool. So just when you thought you were seeing the ecosystem at a large scale, you might have missed the fine scale <laughs> ecosystem that's happening in here. So um, that is really, really interesting. And, and next time you come and visit, keep your eyes out because occasionally we will have these lace wing eggs actually hanging in the exhibit. Usually we have a little signage that tells you what to look for when you're checking out our mangrove trees. But I just think that that is really cool and a really interesting way to help keep things like chemicals out of the water because as you can see, the water is the dominant feature in this ecosystem. And one thing, Taylor, that I want to point out is you're seeing us reach into this exhibit. It is an open air exhibit. And when we first started trialing this beneficial insect, a lot of people were saying, oh no, what if we have swarms of bugs <laughs> in the aquarium? <laughs> so these guys are great when they're larvae. They don't have wings, so they'll stay on the trees. They do go into a chrysalis, just like a butterfly, and they will grow wings. And after that, they're actually pollinators and they're native here in Boston. And so they'll make their way outside of the aquarium and they'll pollinate flowers and they'll contribute to benefits in our environment as outside as well. Look at that, Christina, she's thinking of everything. No fear here. Um, 
Well, Christina, so you talked a little bit about the challenges of our mangrove trees here at the aquarium, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the challenges of mangroves in the wild. There's a reason that the aquarium has chosen to highlight these beautiful, unusual trees, not only in our mangrove exhibit behind us, but also in our shark and ray touch tank. So can you talk a little bit about maybe why we chose to have them and, and kind of what we're trying, the story we're trying to tell about mangroves? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing I wanna point out before I start is if you look at the top of the water in this exhibit, you can see that there's a little bit of a wave and it's coming from the back of the exhibit forward. So again, where these guys are growing, they're coastal. They're right at the edge between land and ocean. So as the waves are coming in, all of that energy is coming in and breaking on this tangle of roots. And as that happens, you can see that the water up front is very calm. So this makes it an ideal environment for juvenile fish. Um, like Taylor mentioned, our shark and ray touch tank is also themed to be mangroves. This is a very important habitat for young sharks. Um, for instance, lemon sharks. It's a very important habitat for young uh, reef fish. They'll start here as juveniles and make their way out onto coral reefs. And it's a very important habitat for people because when giant storms come in, these complex root systems will actually reduce that storm energy. And so if your house is sitting on the beach, right there on the sand and a storm comes in, you probably won't have the same quality of house. Maybe you'll have some broken windows, some creaky boards and other things like that. <laughs> but if you're sitting behind a mangrove forest, you're likely going to be mostly sheltered. And so they're really important for that reason. And unfortunately, they tend to grow in the same places people really like to recreate. And so a lot of mangrove forests are actually torn down to build resorts because they're in these nice white sandy beach areas. Um, and if you take the mangroves out, you can build a, a large hotel and people can sit out and sunbathe. But then when your tsunami comes in, um, the people who live there permanently have some extra challenges. Yeah, so while we not, might not be familiar with mangroves here in New England, the New England version of the mangrove trees are actually salt marshes. So salt marsh grass does similar wave attenuation and prevents soil erosion, just like the roots of these mangrove trees are doing down in tropical areas. So protecting these critical habitats is really important. And there's a number of ways that organizations across the globe are doing this. So simply one way is just to get some legislation in place to protect mangrove trees. We're actually losing mangroves at an alarming rate, somewhere in the 50 to 70% um, range. And so getting some legislation to help protect these is really important. There is legislation here in the United States, down in Florida. You can't remove a mangrove tree without planting another one in the same area. Um, so clear cutting them doesn't typically happen here in the United States, but in other places around the world, they are clear cut, not just for, um, for tourism, but also for growing shrimp, believe it or not. So this is another really easy way that you can help protect mangroves. Find out where the shrimp that you're eating is coming from, making sure that they're mangrove safe shrimp and that we didn't clear cut a mangrove forest in order to farm that shrimp is really, really important. So some easy ways to help protect mangroves from right here in Massachusetts. How about that? Well, I think at this point we should open up the floor to some questions. I think we probably have some questions in the comments this morning. So Michelle, are you seeing any questions out there for us? Oh, excellent question. I'm going to pass that one over to Christina. <laughs> um, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I can tell you that they do tend to be a little bit more shallow and, um, and branch outward. So uh, I, while I don't have an actual number, I can tell you that when you actually look at the mangroves, so this mangrove right here has roots that are coming all the way over to this space in the exhibit. So they really do kind of branch out quite a lot. Very cool. Do you know off the top of your head how deep this tank is? Um, so there's only a couple of inches worth of sand here, and the mangroves themselves actually were initially potted in um, a thicker substrate called mangrove mud. And so that's just um, exactly what it sounds like. It's got a higher nutrient load in it when they're young. Cool. Um, the water is about, I want to say it's somewhere between 18 inches. It's not quite two feet, so it's not super deep. Um, and one thing that's interesting about these guys I wonder if we can see it actually on this tree right here. 
this tree is a little bit overgrown, so it's a little bit hard for me to point out, but they do actually have pores. and so those pores will sit above the water level and allow the tree um to i'm going to use the word respirate very loosely. that's not really you know they're not really breathing. um but it helps them with gas exchange right at that water level because their roots are so submerged and they need to be able to balance for that. very cool. great question to start us off. do we have any other questions out there? how many species of fish Ah, the fish. Christina was hoping someone was going to mention the fish. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we have several species of fish in here. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's somewhere around 20 different species. A lot of these guys are cryptic, and what that means is that they can hide really well, and in the mangrove <laughs> environment, they can hide in plain sight. And so, like I was mentioning earlier, this is a really good environment for juvenile reef fish that will later move. So if you look at these um, blue damsels right here, very brightly colored fish, you can tell that they stick out like a sore thumb because when they're adults, they're going to live on a reef that's very colorful and they'll blend in quite well there. Here in the mangrove, in fact, we've got a cardinal fish right here, right up front for us. We've got a lot of fish that are quite plain. So this fish is going to live here for its entire life. And one thing that I really like about these guys is you can see how he's sort of hovering there. He can just kind of stay in the water column. And when the mangroves do drop leaves and they're floating on the top of the water, these fish really blend in with those leaves. It's quite hard to distinguish what is just a piece of debris and what is a fish, which is good for them for hiding from predators. So there you go. We think about 20, but we got some really excellent hiders in this exhibit, which can make it a little bit tricky to count them all the time. Um, are there certain kinds of birds that live in Oh, absolutely. I don't have a good answer for this. Unfortunately, I'm not a bird person, but maybe we can shoot that over to our shortboard experts and see if they have also some more coastal uh, knowledge than I do. Absolutely. So the again, the birds that we met last time we were together um, are New England species. We don't have any birds living in this exhibit, <laughs> but we will absolutely find out what species of bird prefers mangrove habitat. But I can tell you that in some mangrove habitats, um, a fan favorite sloths do live up in those trees. So there is a hugely diverse ecology that is living up in the treetops as well. Very cool. And what do those fish eat? So um, my fish in here are eating a variety of prepared diets, and that's because they're not getting the same diversity of diet that they would in the wild. So we want to make sure that they're getting vitamins. So we feed them flake and pellets just like you guys probably would at home, but we also substitute that with shrimp um, and other meaty foods like that. Um, you can see also that there is a lot of um, macroalgae growing in here. So there's some red algae right here front and center. There's some green algae growing up on the tree roots. So we've got quite a number of herbivores and omnivores in here that will pick at that. We've got quite a number of um, sand sifters that will actually pull debris out of the sand to eat it. Those and are some so, of my favorites, for sure. Yeah, so in the wild, these um, environments are usually extremely nutrient rich. Um, Taylor mentioned that there's usually Cassiopeia upside down jellyfish um, in this exhibit, and in the wild, they would be kind of in this habitat. And those guys just sift food out of the water column. So there's all kinds of little tiny plankton, um, and debris in the water, and it's very, very rich water uh, for them to eat. Actually, that brings me to a question. Christina, where are the upside down jellies today? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So um, because we're closed right now, we're trying to minimize the number of tasks. We're obviously working on um, a reduced staffing uh, plan. So we've actually moved our upside down jellyfish out of here, sorry, jellies out of here into what I like to call the sun sauna. And so they're downstairs <laughs> in a shallow tray with extremely high lights. Even though the trees um, do need very strong lights, and I pointed that out earlier, and you can see that the light level is really high up here. On your camera, it probably still looks really bright down here. But when you're talking about animals that need light to survive, it's just not strong enough. And so we've moved them into an enclosure with higher lights. And the reason that jellies would need light is because they actually have an algae that lives symbiotically. In other words, they benefit from the algae by getting energy, and the algae benefits by getting protection living inside of the jelly, and uh, much like corals do. And so those guys, the reason they sit upside down is because they're exposing that algae to the light in order to let that algae use photosynthesis and generate food.
Very cool. All right, I think maybe one last question from our viewers this morning. No, we did it. We've answered all the questions. Amazing. Well, Christina, thank you, thank you so much for sharing this amazing exhibit talking all about how you grow trees aquarium style. And I know that both the flora and the fauna in this exhibit <laughs> are in great hands. For my friends at home, if you think of a question after this, just throw it in the comments. Again, we will answer them for you. Christina's brain, my brain, we'll make it happen. Um, and we hope that you join us again live soon and tune in tomorrow to learn a little bit more about our animals and the amazing work that our aquarists are doing every day here at the New England Aquarium. Thanks, friends. Thanks.